Right, it's 10 minutes past eight and uh, it is time for us to turn our attention to the game tonight. Um, delighted to be joined by former Munster rugby player and Pinergy ambassador Tomás O'Leary. It's a historic clash this evening because it's a pork equive. It's Munster against the South African 15. It is an association with Pinergy also proud sponsors of the Munster Senior Schools Cup, continuing to support the province by the hashtag powering the difference for this game, which will see professional rugby played at the famous GA venue for the first time. Uh, Tomás, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning, lads. All good now. Looking forward to the game tonight. A, a sellout from like a week back. Uh, it, it's almost as if the people of Cork really love their rugby. They should have every game in Cork. Uh, <laughs> for, uh, no, look, Tom and Park's obviously going to be the home of Munster rugby, but, you know links like tonight um, will illustrate that you know there is a there's a hunger and there's a demand for for games in Cork and hopefully if this is the first of many you know we hopefully might even end up seeing quarterfinals semi-finals of European Cup games and the big Leinster Derby games around Christmas It'd be great to have them down in Cork so yeah look I think it's a great occasion for for Munster Rugby Cork GA and and the people of Cork so looking forward to tonight and hopefully we can get the fixture that uh that the you know that the occasion warrants it's funny how we go full circle in this whole thing because um, there was definitely a period of time where it felt like the players in Munster felt like having two separate training bases and uh, half the team based in Cork and half the team based in Limerick wasn't great. And then the high performance um, was was finished in Limerick and everybody felt like that's definitely the right thing. But in the meantime, something got lost a little bit with the connection with Cork and it's this feels like it might be a springboard to get that whole thing back up. Yeah, I agree with you there. Um, look, I suppose back back in the day, like it, I suppose the, there was pros and cons of the, the dual set. Um, I suppose we made it work. You know, it almost brought a freshness to the to each training session. You know, when you meet the Limerick lads, there'd be a bit of slagging, bit of competition between the Limerick and Cork camps, and uh, you know, I used to meet each other to tell the stories of what was happening down in Cork and Limerick, um, and it was it was just good crack. Um, obviously, we couldn't train as much together, so. I suppose that was the major con, but um, it just added a freshness to the dynamic and, and, and it seemed to work. Look, obviously, professional rugby probably has evolved and the demands of professional rugby have evolved since then. We see that with the with the way the game has been played. So, look, I don't think you probably could have a, a dual centre anymore. Uh, but look, yeah, look, the people at Cork, I suppose we do get our games down here in Musgrave Park, but generally, um, they're, they're, they're what are, are, if we're honest, they're lesser fixtures. Um, so look, I think there is a is a real hunger for the people of Cork to be exposed to the top level of rugby and to to see an international team being welcomed to to uh, to Musgrave Park. I nearly said to Park Equive tonight. Um, you know, you can see the appetite for tickets. Um, you know, I'm I've been asked for tickets for the last few weeks as well, and you know, it was sold out after a couple of days. So yeah, look, I think it's important. You know, at the end of the day, Cork is the centre of population for Munster, and you would think that most players should be coming from. The highest centre of population. That's the case in Leinster. Most of the players come from Dublin. Not all the players, obviously. So I think yeah, Cork needs definitely needs to be uh, given more fixtures, and hopefully this is a nod from Munster Rugby uh, that there is going to be more fixtures down here in Parky Cueve. It's ne- it's nearly highlighted that even more, Tomas. Like this this fixture, the fact that there is so much GA talent as well as rugby talent down in Cork, and and you are one of those people with the All Ireland minor hurling title as well. And for for people like yourself and Darren Sweetnam. You probably had that crossroads when you when you were younger. You've got two red jerseys, both steeped in tradition, and you've got to make that choice. Um, and I guess the lure of professionalism sends a lot of people towards rugby. But games like tonight, you know, a massive monster game in, in Parky Cueve kind of highlights that for a lot of young players, yourself included, there was a decision to make. Yeah, look, they're exactly that. And look, I suppose, as you said, I grew up in a, in a, hurling, a hurling household and the, the only jersey I wanted to wear for a majority of my 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 youth was the blood and bandage of Cork. Uh, I wanted to emulate my father and I suppose emulate great players that have gone on to win all Ireland's in the past. Um, you know, and I suppose the old the old saying now, if if you can't see it, you can't be it. So like I'm bringing my my seven year old to the match tonight, and you know I think that might you know those experiences they leave they leave an indelible impact on young kids. So if he's at a packed out Parky Queef seeing monster players play against the likes of South Africa. Um, that leaves an imprint on his mind and you know that can focus him so you know he will be exposed to other sports he will be exposed to GA and soccer and a few more and it's those experiences that will guide him and will I suppose make him uh, you know select a sport down the line I think players and kids play as many sports um, until as late as they can and obviously if they're good enough they'll be fortunate enough to have a I suppose have a decision to make and 
I was lucky that I had gone on to see Munster play in European quarterfinals, play in European semi-finals. You know, I was looking up to the likes of Ron O'Gara, Paul O'Connell, all these guys, and I wanted to be part of that. Yes, I wanted to be a professional rugby player, but I wanted to be part of that team. I wanted to be play with those guys and and I suppose stand for what they stood for. So it's not just the, the opportunity to be a pro professional athlete, it's the opportunity to experience occasions like that and play on occasions like that. So that's why I think it's very, very important for young Cork kids and, and, and Cork families to be exposed to high-level rugby and top-level rugby. I was talking a little bit about this and it was kind of more instinctive than anything based on evidence yesterday that uh, it feels like Munster, it's far more acceptable for you to be a fan of everything, um, whereas like uh, sports fandom in Leinster is a bit more segmented. There are Dublin Gaelic football fans and there are Leinster fans. And there's some crossover, but there's not as significant a crossover, I would argue, as there is between Cork Hurling fans and Munster rugby fans. It just seems as if it's totally accepted. You're a Cork Hurling fan, you're also a Munster rugby fan, and there's no real division. Maybe around the fringes, there's some areas of division. Is that true? Am I making that up? Uh, well, certainly, I, true in, in the most part. Look, like you said, there is there is a, a certain uh, element that just focus on one one sport. Um, but yeah, look, I suppose, and a lot of people will be members of GA clubs and rugby clubs. Um, so look, I think, yeah, look, as you said, it's not just GA, it's not just soccer, it's not just um, you know the traditional rugby sports down here. You know, you got you got a lot of different athletes who've come from here. Obviously, Sonia Sullivan, Rob Heffernan. See, the soccer influence is very big. Um, in terms of Roy Keane, so the Roars down in West Cork, so it's a very broad, um, I suppose, sporting interest, and that's something we're, I suppose, proud of down here. And I think, it, like I said, I think specialisation in sport from an early age, and look, there's been a lot of different, uh, I suppose, studies done in that. But I think the more sports you can play, the broader, I suppose, influence you can have, the more skills you learn, and that's just not not just ter- that's not just in terms of the actual skills themselves; it's in terms of strategy. And it's in terms of spatial awareness. So I think all those skills develop a kid and socially as well. Um, they're not so focused on one sport, not so concentrated on one sport, and there's probably less pressure. So look, I think certainly Cork people support multiple sports, uh, but Munster Rugby definitely is up there and Munster Rugby is a special place in, in I suppose most people, uh, Cork people. And that's why it's important that you know Cork people don't have to always travel to Limerick, don't have yeah. to always go abroad to see them. So, you know, they can they can finish work, go for a pint and, and stroll down to Parky Cueve. I think the more things we can provide for, for Cork people, the better, yeah. The reason I was talking about it really was because I, I believe very strongly that Cork GA has a very progressive CEO who's doing really great work and has managed to transform the club championship and get it into, uh, you know, with the support of many people, it has to be said, but get it into a situation where you're starting to see the underage players come through to senior club ranks. And it'll be very interesting to see over the next couple of years how the senior teams do. But as part of that, they've decided to go, we're actually brave enough and willing to invite rugby into Porky Cueve in a way that I think they're going to benefit from in the long run, not just from the gate receipts from tonight or whatever the financial arrangements are, that actually you can mobilise a fan base by getting people to go to things and actually not being threatened by the other sports. Yeah, look, I agree. And I think it's uh, it's indicative of how society has moved on. Um, a majority of the GA people who may have no influence or, or no relation to rugby would be supportive of this fixture. Um, so again, it's a it's a wider, uh, I suppose, societal uh, reflection as well. Um, and I, I agree with you. Look, you look, even look at Limerick GA and the impact they've had, and maybe that has had a slight negative impact on on rugby in Limerick. And, and, and look, I suppose there is competition when it comes to lads at 17, 18 years of age and the top talent. You look at that, um, you know, with uh, Ben O'Connor here down in Cork, in the sixth year prez, he just won a county final. Playing with the Bars, senior hurling, lost the county final to Nemo, playing with the Bars. He was with Prez last year, got to the senior cup final. I know he's been looked at for potentially a Munster Academy. So those guys, there's also going to be competition for that. But at the end of the day, it's going to be an individual decision. And we know that the likes of Ben O'Connor, the likes of Darren Sweetenham, who you already uh, spoke with earlier, I know he played in a Lauren semi final with Cork. Um, end of the day, it's going to be a personal decision. They'd love to play with both, but that's not feasible. So um, I don't think the GA or, or Munster Rugby can really influence that decision. We just have to provide those kids with the best possible experiences growing up. Um, and I agree, you know, Cork GA is very progressive. And now it's up to Munster Rugby, which um, tonight's fixture is an illustration that they're progressive and they, they're keen to have top-level rugby played in Cork. You touched, Tomas, on, on, on the importance of, of young kids growing up playing playing a multitude of different sports. And like you mentioned, 
um, spatial awareness or something there. And I know even for, you know playing hurling back in your, your day, probably playing hurling, it was fifteen on fifteen. That the game has changed probably slightly, um, and even things like hand-eye coordination. Do you think like your background in hurling almost? Gave you an advantage in rugby in terms of, do you know? Do you think it improved your your ability to, to get through and reach the level at rugby that that you did? Yeah, I don't know really. Um, it certainly didn't, didn't do me any harm, uh, and I do think those hand eye coordination skills are, you know, really really important. So yeah, look, you can't get much much uh, much more of uh, a suitable sport for hand eye coordination than than hurling. Um, uh, look, I, I do think it gave me an appreciation of, I suppose. Uh, you know, of, of space, like you said, look, it was more man on man, 15 on 15, and you might get the odd fella coming in here uh, next year, you know, for a breaking ball. But I think the current game um, it has gone so tactical. Um, it's almost cat like rugby. I was speaking to a few, a few rugby coaches during the weekend. Like rugby is so nuanced, um, so tactical now um, that it's a, it's a really, really enjoyable game to coach. And, Gaelic football is getting so possession orientated. Even now, hurling, you see the Limerick team and you see other teams. You know, it's all about possession and how to create space for inside forwards and and the movement off the ball and and the movement to get on the ball and shorter passes. So that's becoming more more nuanced as well. So coaching at hurling, coaching at football is becoming, I suppose, uh, it's catching up with rugby, becoming as as strategic. Obviously, you won't have the set piece well, if, you, if you don't consider puck out set piece. Um, so. It's it's certainly there is elements that are are, are becoming very uh, I, I suppose uh, very similar. Um, but the hand-eye coordination probably is probably the biggest piece. Look, end of the day, if you can if you can catch a slur from 70, 80 yards, control it on a hurley and stick it over the bar, that's certainly going to benefit your ability to to catch a rugby ball or to pass a rugby ball. I think so. Yeah, I definitely think that as many kids should be should be playing as many sports as possible. Obviously, when these fixtures happen, the Ireland players are away and uh, they're not considered for selection. So, you know, you would kind of think, oh, it's not necessarily Munster's strongest team. But then you see the team named and it is still a really strong, exciting team with that sprinkling of incredible youth and some experience in it as well. So what, what level of performance do you expect from, like, just to go back to Roundtree has said he's not going to let the players out onto the pitch for the first time. Obviously, the kickers will be there, but like not everybody's going to go out and see the crowd until they actually go out. So it's going to be like the place is going to be on fire. Uh, what, do, what level of performance should we expect from Munster tonight? I don't know. Um, I suppose Munster has struggled for honest start to the season, um, and I think this is an opportunity, almost a free shot. Um, pressure is off these guys. You know, there's no league points. There's no, I suppose, the negative discourse that is around Munster rugby. And you know, will they qualify for the Champions Cup? Um, the new coaching ticket is taking time to to, to bed in their ideas. Um, you know, this is a separate fixture. This is a standalone fixture. Uh, Munster have a chance to. To knock uh, an international 15 off their perch, the world champions. I know it's not their first side, but it's a really, really strong uh, South Africa select. So um, I suppose this this is just giving this monster team basically a free shot and the motivation. Hopefully, like you said, the atmosphere created by the monster fans that's going to give give this give this monster team an impetus, a motivation, a bounce that hopefully will bring an energy. And I think even though rugby, as I said, has become a lot more strategic and tactical. Um, you know, when you have that physical motivation, when you have that, um, I suppose, that physical prowess or, or, you know, that extra 10, 15 percent that an atmosphere like tonight can provide, you know, I think that is powerful. Uh, and we all know that Munster will need to be physical tonight to stand up to how South Africa are going to play the game. So if Munster can can have that kind of, uh, I suppose, that it's, it's hard to gauge, but, you know, when a team is at it physically, uh, and I think everything else will flow after that. So hopefully, you know, it's, it'll be interesting to see the likes of Frisch coming in in the centre. Uh, and, you know, Paddy Patterson, looking forward to seeing him at nine. You know, can he manage uh, a monster team around the park? Can he dictate the tempo um, in a night like tonight? It looks like it might be be uh, be wet and, and, and windy down here, you know, playing at half seven at night. Ball's going to be dewy uh, anyway. So you're not going to be able to play a lot of rugby early days against this hard-pressed South Africa defence. So look, it's going to be very, very interesting as to how Munster approach the game. But I definitely think occasions like this, um, you know, they're standalone fixtures, and players are not going to be thinking about the league. Players not going to think about Irish rugby. It's trying to create history for this Munster group, and hopefully that can create a powerful um, bond within the team and give them a real jump tonight. Talk to us about the nines, will you? What what have you seen about uh, Patterson that you liked, and what are the bits that he needs to work on? 
Um, well, I suppose I haven't seen an old pile really thus far this season. I like his tempo. Um, but, you know, he can only have tempo if he gets front foot ball. If Munster, I suppose, don't get go forward balls. So, um, you know, if, if the South African defence is on top, all of a sudden his ability to have that high tempo, uh, quick rook ball is gone. And then they're going to have to go to the air. And we all know that South Africa like 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 that. So um, if he gets quick tempo ball, um, if Munster can get go forward ball, again, that's down to dynamic ball carries, maybe carrying a soft shoulders um, in the rook. The, the, you know the, the lads in the rook, you know, basically clearing the threat before the the opportunity is, is gone for them to get on the ball. Then I think he moves the ball really nicely and he looks good. Um, the question for me is, you know, if that ball becomes slow ball, you know, has he got the ability um, to control it like um, a Conor Murray? You know, good box kicks, giving our wingers an opportunity to compete. Because I know um, South Africa having worked under Erasmus and Nienenbar. They place a big emphasis on that kick contest, on their wingers winning that, and on the rest of the players then winning the scrap. So, I think that you know, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have a real flow, uh, free-flowing game tonight. Um, and I think it's going to come down to, I suppose, the physical confrontation. And I think it's going to come down to ball in the air and, and, and who's going to win that kicking contest. So, that's the question mark we have over Patterson. And look, it's, we're going to get a lot of answers tonight. Yeah, big opportunity for him. What what's the the pecking order at the moment? Um, how how close is Craig Casey to being the monster number one? And uh, I mean, maybe he's going to get an opportunity now that uh, Conor Murray got injured last week. Um, it was kind of interesting to see Conor Murray getting the start against South Africa, and very unfortunate in that precise moment that he makes the break that we've been dying for him to do. He actually picks up an injury. So, what, what how close is that battle at the moment? Very close. Um... You get a sense that Munster want to really play at a real high tempo. Um, and, you know, I suppose Casey's more of the ilk of Gibson Park than, than Connor is. And I think, uh, you know, basically, I think international rugby is, is, a diff- is, a different, is a different game altogether. You can see the impact that Connor had with his defensive abilities, his physical, his physical, uh, his physical nature. Um, in the first half, you know, he, he made a lot, a lot of tackles. And like I said, then he got, got his little line break, unfortunately, before his injury. Um, so when Connor plays like that, um, definitely he he'll, he'll be second choice and certainly second choice for for Ireland. The, the, the thing that this Munster team is trying to trying to create is is a way of playing and a, I suppose a new approach to the game. And I think Casey seems to suit that. Um, and Munster just haven't quite clicked into gear yet. Um, I suppose they're getting used to new new strategy, a new a new uh, a new way of playing the game. But I, I do think they seem to be trying to push Casey to be to be that fulcrum, to be that key key player. And then Connor to be coming on. So my sense is with that Casey is is going to be the first choice, and and, and Murr will be the, the the closer, the fellow to come on and finish games or add his experience. You know, maybe when they were playing the likes of uh, La Rochelle or they were playing the likes of the Saracens in the European quarterfinal, then there's a conversation: Do you start Murray? Do you u- utilize his physical prowess? Do you utilize his experience? So I think it's very much going to be a case of you know give Casey as much experience as possible. You know, get him as the fulcrum of this team. But when the needs uh, dictate, you bring in Murray and he starts. He starts the odd game that uh, that requires a more physical, abrasive, and experience from half. It obviously hasn't been uh, the season that Munster would have wanted so far, Tomas. But like you look at some of the recent URC games, and you're you're looking at the bench, and you're seeing a, a lot of lads under the age of 23. Um, like it's a bit of a rebuild project, I guess, for for Graham Rowntree. Like, does he have, regardless of results at the minute, and they haven't been good. He has a bit of credit credit in the bank, surely, and, and, and you know if you do label it as a rebuild project, he will have time to create what he wants. Yeah, look, it's I think so. I think um, from chatting to the players, they're very excited about uh, this current uh, management group. Um, and look, while um, what they're working on on the on the training paddock hasn't really translated in terms of performance onto the onto the pitch. Um, you know, I know there's, there's certainly uh, confidence within the playing group that they're going to get there. Um, like you said, look, the, the players that, that are coming, uh, getting opportunity to be exposed at, at the top level uh, and, and the age profile of that is exciting for, for Munster Rugby. And I think like that, so the, the emergence of, of some young talent and I'd say the fixture like tonight, I think there almost is a bit of an apathy developing, you know, uh, regarding Munster Rugby, um, you know, from from media, from some ex-players, from supporters, um, or certainly there's perception that it is. Um, fixtures like tonight maybe can give the opportunity for, you know, the bond 
between supporters and players, something that Munster was always really, really, um, I suppose, famous for. If you could have a fixture tonight and a performance tonight from the players, then you think you can get that 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 bond will be re-strengthened, that bond will start to re-emerge. Um, you know that symbiotic kind of relationship between the players and the and the fans. You know one needs the one needs the other uh, in order for them both to perform at the highest level. I think it, tonight is a big opportunity for the players to give a performance for the supporters then to get on. Uh, you know really sub- start supporting like monster supporters can. So. And then again, when most supporters see younger players from Cork, Limerick, Waterford, West Cork, all these different places coming on, being given a chance and they see honest performances, then that relationship will start to, to re-strengthen. I think that's key for this Munster, Munster team and key for Munster in general is that really that relationship between Munster fans and supporters remains strong. And, and I suppose it goes back to the, goes back to the level that it used to be at. We spoke uh, yesterday, Tomas, to, uh, to Keith Ward about... Um... Razi Erasmus and his uh, his little Twitter videos after the, the win over South Africa. And I know he's someone who has uh, a lot of fans down in Munster and a lot of people uh, think great things of him. Uh, like, what do you make of, of these little bits on social media that pop up every now and again? Like, a lot of people describe it as sour grapes, um, but I guess it's just peak Razi. Yeah, look, I, I personally don't like it anyway, but um, I think it's kind of petulant. Um, you know, every coach could pick out numerous instances in every game. Um, and look, I think it just sets a bad example. Like if, if you know, I'm, I'm coaching young kids and I'm coaching schoolboys, and if that's the kind of carry on that you know, and obviously he's the head head man in South Africa. You know, he you know he's got a lot of young coaches looking up to him. He's got a lot of young kids looking up to him. I don't think in this day and age, you know, the pressure on referees. You know, we see the pressure on GA referees, soccer referees. You know, how they actually are physically threatened as well. And now when you, you focus in on their mistakes, I think it's going to be harder and harder to get referees, particularly at that top level, when their mistakes are going to be highlighted like that. It also sets a bad precedent to your team. Um, you know what I mean? You can analyse all that um, internally as a team. And, you know, obviously there is external influence and the referee does have it. But, yeah, look, I don't like that side of it anyway. Certainly not. Look, I think he is obviously a very, very good um coach or director of rugby did a brilliant job in, in, in Munster really brought up the levels in terms of performance um, he obviously did the same in South Africa going on to win a World Cup so you know he, he knows how to how to get a group tick and he knows how to how to lead a group but I think he, he I think they lets himself down with, with that kind of carry on there's a sense that um, Nathan had a theory that it was a bit like Jose Mourinho comes in has an immediate impact but that eventually on the players the same message and the same sense of like okay it's this is how it's going to be and I'm going to be at the centre of absolutely everything and I'm going to take all the, the trouble but I'm also going to get a lot of the credit if it's there that there's a there's a bang of that off off the, the Razzie way of doing things incredible short term impact but not really that sustainable yeah look I don't know um, I suppose he wasn't in Munster long enough for for us to, 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 to see whether it would have been sustainable or um, you know and Obviously in South Africa, you know, he he had that initial bounce, definitely winning a World Cup. So now the question is, you know, we're going to see over the next even even you know this weekend they're going to be playing against France. So potentially they'll have two two losses on the bounce. What happens then? Um, like you said, going into the World Cup next year, you know teams are getting a lot more competitive. Like I already mentioned, France, Ireland are now number one in the world. New Zealand seem to be getting their mojo back together. Australia are capable of, of that good performance or brilliant performance. Argentina as well, so I think it's a lot, lot more competitive landscape internationally. So it'll be very, very interesting um, to see if they can maintain those standards. And yeah, look, there. If you look from the outside, certainly it might seem like that. That you know he likes to be uh, ahead in front of everything, and even you know that's the case. You know Jack Nienbauer is the the head coach. Yeah, most of the, I suppose the conversation and is about Erasmus all the time. So uh, potentially you might be right in your assertion there. Right. Good stuff. Tomas, uh, what's going to happen tonight? Give me a, give me a prediction. Uh, hard to know. Probably South Africa, but I'm going to have to have to say Munster. To, to, these fixtures always seem to, to bring performance and, and hopefully this is the performance that Munster need to kick on and, and get their season back and, back and going. Yeah, it's a real opportunity for them. Great to have you with us, Tomas. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, lads.